Welcome everyone to tonight's very exciting food and movement when living with metastatic breast cancer webcast. I'm so thrilled that this is a topic that we are going to have some amazing experts to ensure that you are armed with all the right information. And then of course, we will hear from two fabulous women who are living with metastatic breast cancer. I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on the lands that everyone tonight is meeting on. For us here, it's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I want to pay my respects to elders past, present, and acknowledge the future leaders of our First Nations. We must do better to ensure we close the gap for our First Peoples in this country. And I am so grateful that we have learned so much from our First Peoples that are very much at the centre of our network. And that is about sharing stories and lived experiences. So we have a lot to be grateful for, for our First Nations people. Bit of housekeeping, first of all, questions are anonymous, but the chat is not. So uh, just know that your name will appear on the, si on the side as you put information into the chat. So please know we want to encourage questions to send through, which come through to me so I can pretend to be Virginia Trioli on Q&A. Um, and then, but we really want to also encourage you to have the um, chat with each other. There are more than 500 of you online tonight. So please use this as an opportunity to connect with each other and learn from each other's experiences. I do also just from a cyber security perspective, want to say that there is one BCNA staff member who will be putting in links to the uh, chats. So those uh, we can assure you will be safe, but please we'll ask that no one else puts links into those chats just to ensure that we can be um, safe from any cyber attacks. So for nearly 25 years, BCNA has been the voice for those diagnosed with breast cancer. Whether this has meant for new drugs to be subsidised and it was fantastic to see Tradel V put on the PBS for metastatic people this year, or whether it's about appointing trained consumer representatives in important policy work or raising awareness what of what it means to get the optimal care. And we are really committed to ensuring that everyone with breast cancer receives the best care, treatment and support. And continuing on this legacy for Metastatic Breast Cancer Day in October this year, we announced the publication of the inaugural issues paper entitled Making Metastatic Breast Cancer Count. Those of you living with metastatic breast cancer tell us often how you feel invisible amongst the sea of pink. And really this issues paper, we are shining a light on those with metastatic breast cancer and using modeling to estimate that there are now over 10,000 Australian women, men and people living with metastatic breast cancer in this country. The sad reality is though, however, we cannot currently know for sure because counting is not consistent by our cancer registries. And we absolutely are committed to making sure that this changes. We are calling for national leadership, investment and accountability, as well as legislative change to ensure that those of you living with metastatic breast cancer are counted and are visible, not just in our network, but in all of our public health system. We must have this visibility to be able to plan for and invest in the ongoing needs of those living with metastatic breast cancer. So you will be able to, uh, we hope you receive the issues paper through the network, but if not, you will be able to find that on our web link. And I really encourage you to help us to create a strong voice for all of you. And I want to say as the CEO, but also from all of our team and the board, we see you and we hear you and we want to make sure we are here for you every step of the way. So on to tonight's webcast and as I said I'm really so thrilled um, about this particular topic because we know that so many of you find it challenging to participate in clinical trials and other activities once you are diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer. So as well as helping you get as much enjoyment out of living well with metastatic breast cancer, 
we want to make sure that we can give you the right information at the right time. We know also that sometimes it's the last thing you feel like doing, but research definitely shows us that regular and properly supervised exercise can improve the way your body copes with symptoms and side effects as well as treatment. So I want to welcome um, Erin, Eva and Laura and Lisa who are going to share with us tonight their experiences and really help to address some of the questions that you have. So I would encourage you at any point in time to put questions in so that we can deal with it at the end as uh, part of our question and answer sessions. We do have three poll questions that I'd love you to take some time just to answer right now. And these will really help us to shape some of our questions, but also to understand your needs. And I do know that there are many health professionals on the uh, line tonight. So I would ask if you are a person living with or affected by breast cancer that you complete these poll questions. So have you discussed a chronic disease management plan with your GP in relation to diet and exercise? This will help us to really understand what influence we need to do with healthcare professionals. The second poll question, have you been able to access allied health services such as a dietitian, exercise physiologist or physiotherapist? We know the healthcare system is under enormous pressure right now, so it's great for us to be able to get a sense from you as to whether you are able uh, to have access to really important, supportive and allied care health. And the third question is prior to tonight, had you been aware of our recently launched issues paper? We know we send out lots of information through our network and we just want to make sure what we are getting through to you and what we may not. I hope to come back to some of these poll questions later on, but I really appreciate everyone spending some time to help us prepare for the Q&A session. So I am going to hand on to our very first speaker tonight, Erin, who is a dietitian, a clinical dietitian at Peter Mac here in Melbourne um, within haematology. Breast and sarcoma tumour streams. And I think I love this, Erin, that you aim to assist patients in maintaining a great quality of life throughout their treatment and the use of nutrition. And I think quality of life is often underestimated when it comes to people uh, living with metastatic disease. So I'm going to hand the controller over to you <laughs> and we look forward to being informed around diet. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, so oh, I'm just going to go this one instead. There we go. That's me. Um, so thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. I know, you know, it's going to be a little bit of a chunk of your night, um, but hopefully it's a really helpful um, thing for you guys to learn about. Um, and I know the lovely ladies here have a lot of information for you. So thank you very much um, for your time. In terms of who I am, I'm yeah, a clinical dietitian at Peter McCallum here in Melbourne, and I work within the um, haematology, breast and sarcoma tumour stream. So I am very familiar with all of my patients that are living with not only just breast cancer, but metastatic breast cancer as well. So I'm really hoping that um, tonight is gonna be very practical for you. Um, so just quickly what I'm going to be talking about with you all tonight, um, eating well during your cancer treatment and what that's actually going to look like for you, knowing that everybody has different experiences and it's going to look different for everybody. Um, we want some practical tips for managing your side effects. Again, each treatment is going to come with different side effects. And so learning how to manage these ones, and I've included some of the most common ones, um, is going to help you hopefully um, get through your treatment. A little bit of myth busting. Um, I'm sure you've probably noticed as well, there is always a little bit of myths that come with um, these topics in particular. Um, and then how to find some trusted information. Um, and I've got some useful resources for you and your family to have a read through as well that you can follow on um, later on. And we might even be able to include some of the links to send to you guys as well. So what does eating well during cancer treatment um, and specifically, you know, metastatic breast treatment, what is that going to look like? Um, it's going to be different for everyone to be quite simple. Um, it depends on the dosage of your medication. It depends on your lifestyle. It depends on your stress factors. There's lots of things that come into account and it also depends on your activity levels, which Eva, I'm sure you would agree with. Um, 
So different treatments are going to have different side effects and that may mean that fatigue is one, maybe weight gain or weight loss, um, things like feeling nauseous or vomiting. Um, it can be really difficult when you're going through treatment. It can be really hard. So making sure that you know how to tackle these things and who to go for to assist you with tackling these things is going to be really handy. Um, the biggest aim that I really like to share with my patients, and I know that that's across the board with a lot of dietitians that work with patients with metastatic breast cancer, is that we want you to be able to eat enough calories so that you can maintain your weight, so you're not losing weight and not necessarily gaining a lot of weight. But we also want you to have enough protein so that we can keep your muscles nice and strong and we can support your energy levels and your immune function. So what does it look like? Um, studies have actually shown that maintaining your weight through eating a wide variety of fruits, vegetables, grains, meats, um, all things from the fired food groups um, is actually going to support your treatment tolerance throughout your treatment duration. It's going to help you bounce back from your side effects a lot quicker um, and it helps you keep your quality of life at its best and that's exactly what we're here to help you with tonight. Um, so the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating, there's five food groups that we want you to really include. So fruits, veggies, um, nuts and seeds, so your grains. Um, we want your lean meats. And then we've also got things like dairy foods as well. We want you to have lots and lots of water. Hydration is always going to be key and it really does help when it comes to, you know, metabolizing your medications as well. Um, and we want to try and limit the amount of saturated fats or things like sugars that are just going to be giving you a little bit of a spike with your blood glucose levels. Um, but in saying that, we do really want to make sure that you're getting enough energy in your day to day. So in saying this, your side effects are going to be changing things for you. So whilst you might have the perfect diet in your mind, it is really important that you're going to be flexible during this period of time as well so that you can make room for things to help support you get through your treatment. So I'm going to talk about loss of appetite as this is one that I've found to be one of the most common with patients that have metastatic breast cancer. And in this instance, it's really important to make sure that we're prioritising high energy, high protein type foods. So I've got a few photos there and a little bit of images of what that would look like. So we're talking about lean meats, meat, chicken, fish. If you're a vegetarian, that's fine. You can have things like tofu or lentils. Um, dairy foods are going to be really good for you as well. So trying to include lots of those foods that we've included in that image there. Uh, nourishing drinks or oral nutrition support supplements, things like Sustagen, which some of you may have heard of before. There's a wide variety of things that we can use, but even something like a Big M or an Up and Go can be really helpful. Sometimes it's also easier to drink your calories rather than having to chew it and eat it as well. Um, small frequent meals. So instead of sitting down and having a huge meal, having something a little bit smaller more frequently can be a little bit more useful so that you don't feel like you're overloading your system too much. Uh, eating by the clock. So that's very similar to having the small frequent meals. Sometimes it's really handy to just set an alarm clock on your phone. So once an hour on the hour, you just have a few mouthfuls of food and it doesn't have to be a whole snack. It can just be a few mouthfuls and that's totally adequate. Um, Try and think of your food as medicine and part of your treatment. You need to have your chemotherapy X amount of times a month. You need to take your treatment X amount of month. So having your food, it's a non-negotiable. You have to try and include it every day so that you know that you can continue on with your treatment, you can have a great quality of life and you can keep up with the kids and the family. Um, and get social, eating with others. This has actually been studied quite extensively and people that eat with more people tend to eat larger volumes. So it's definitely important if you can, whenever you're having your meals, to sit around with your friends and your family, um, any other people that you feel comfortable in doing so, because it can really be a beneficial tool. Nausea, which is another one that um, kind of comes hand in hand with loss of appetite. A lot of the time, if you're feeling nauseous, you will therefore have a loss of appetite. So definitely first and foremost, make sure you're chatting to your doctor, having a very transparent relationship with your treating team is going to be one of the best things that you can do. And if you don't feel comfortable with your doctor, ask around and see who else is available for you to talk to. Because if you've got a good relationship with your doctor, then you're halfway there. So there are some medications um, that you can take to help with this. Um, and if you are going to do that, make sure that you are consulting your doctor and you are consulting a pharmacist as well. If you are taking these medications, try to have them 30 to 40 minutes before your meal so that they've got time to take effect so that 
they actually work and you don't feel sick. Um, try not to skip meals. Every day our body is producing a lot of fluid and gastric content. So even in the morning, if you're feeling like really nauseous, it's probably because your tummy's a bit empty too. So even just having a few mouthfuls of something can be really helpful. A few biscuits, half a banana, a few mouthfuls of something, anything can sometimes take the edge off. Even throughout the day, if you can just do eating by the clock and have a few mouthfuls, that's really going to be setting you up for a good success with that. Choose dry, salty foods, anything that's bland. Um, try to brush your teeth as often as you can. That's a really important thing too, which I think a lot of people that even don't have metastatic breast cancer could benefit from when it comes to feeling a bit nauseous. Um, using mouthwash if, you're, if your um, hospital gives it to you and making sure that you're really making the most of the oral hygiene because a bad taste in the mouth is really just going to make things feel worse for you. And there's a couple of other options here too. Things like ginger lollies or dry ginger. Um, you can have lemonade or some peppermint tea too. So bowel problems can be another thing that people really struggle with when it comes to cancer treatments, whether it's having diarrhea or completely opposite end, having constipation. Neither is very comfortable. Ideally, we'd like you to be going maybe once to twice a day. Um, so lots of things can cause this. It can be caused by radiation, depending on where the mapping is. It can be chemotherapy or immunotherapy. Um, stress is a really big one that can really stimulate the gut system as well, because you've got that gut-brain axis that works very rampantly when you're a bit anxious. Um, lots of medications can implicate this as well. So always talk to your doctor again if there are any symptoms. Um, it will do you the world of favours. The biggest thing for both constipation and diarrhea is to make sure that you're drinking enough. If you've got diarrhea, you tend to be losing a lot of fluid. So making sure that you're replenishing that and keeping your electrolytes in balance is going to be really helpful for you. It also means that you can continue on with your treatment and it doesn't wipe you out too much. Um, and constipation can also actually really implicate when it comes to your appetite. If you're backlogged for a couple of days, you're not going to be feeling very hungry. So really making sure that you're trying to go every day if you can, can be really helpful. And drinking enough water and having enough fibre from your fruits and, veg fruits and veggies can really help you go more regularly as well. Fatigue, and this is another really big one that a lot of the metastatic breast cancer patients have, and it's a bugger of a thing. It really does linger around. Um, so something that we can do to make sure that you can continue on to, you know, if you're providing for your family and you're doing all the cooking in the house for yourself and for others, is maybe try to go with some easier steps. So go for meals that are going to be really simple, that only have a few steps. Jamie Oliver's simple meals are great. The five ingredients one, I highly recommend that you go for it if you can. Um, go for pre-prepared or frozen meals as well. There's lots in the freezer section that are both high energy and high protein. My muscle chef is a great one, not doing a plug, but that's a great one to go for. Um, and also going for ingredient prepping. So you can cut up your fruits and veggies, you can marinate your lambs or your meat or your chicken or whatever you're doing ahead of time so that when it does come to cooking, you're not having to do all of the ingredients at the one time. Um, accept meals from your friends and your family as well. This is a really big one. And, you know, for the people that do have really supportive families, that's often the first thing that families love to give is something to do with food or to help you out so you don't have to do as much from home. If you don't have that, then you're more than welcome to chat to things like social workers or to see what other supports are out there. Meals on Wheels is something that you potentially could look into as well. So there's lots of services, including home delivery of groceries, which I've popped up there as well, which is fantastic. Um, probably one of the best things to come from COVID, I think. Um, and exercise, including exercises into your routine where you can, which Eva's going to talk about as well. So some common myths and anti-cancer diets, which are quite common. Um, and the sugar feeds cancer is quite, you know, it's the biggest one that we get every day. Um, and I just want to pull aside that there is a really great resource on the Cancer Council website that goes through lots of myth busting. Um, there is some on the BCNA website as well. Um, and Peter Mac have some on their website too. So definitely utilise those resources to get information. Um, but basically the myth is that you know, cancer feeds off sugar. And so we need to starve our body of sugar and remove all sugar from our diet so that we're able to kill off the cancer cells. In reality, though, unfortunately, this isn't the case and there are no studies that support this. Um, 
in terms of things, yes, cancer is a metabolically active component in your body. It's going to feed off whatever it can find to grow. And if you're not providing your body with enough calories and enough protein and energy, it's going to reach into your muscle stores and your fat stores. And that's when we're going to start seeing some weight loss. And if you're losing weight, it means that you're going to find your side effects are going to hit you a bit harder. It's going to be a lot harder to move through your treatment. And you may even find that your dosing might need to be reduced a bit too to make up for it. So it's it's definitely a scary thing. I understand that there's lots of misinformation out there, but there are no evidence to support this out there. So definitely make sure that you're working towards having adequate nutrition in terms of calories and protein so that you can keep up your muscles, keep up your energy and keep on with your treatment. Intermittent fasting is another big one. Um, and again, the theory is that intermittent fasting can prevent cancer and it can help with the cancer recovery. All in all, this is typically something that is done as a weight loss strategy. And it's because it reduces the opportunity and reduces the window that you have to get enough protein and energy in. And what it means is that you're at an increased risk of losing weight. And again, as we just discussed before, the more weight you lose, the harder it is for you to continue on with your treatment. So it's definitely not recommended. Um, if you really want to try it and give it a go, you're more than welcome to chat to a dietitian or your doctor. Um, you know, nutrition is one of those things where you do remain to have agency over throughout your entire treatment. You know, it's not very likely that you're going to know what dosage of chemotherapy you're going to need, but it's very easy for you to be able to control what you put in your mouth. So if you want to give things a try and if it's going to help you feel a bit better, that's the priority. But as long as you've got in con informed consent and you know what the risks and the benefits are, then it's definitely fine. So if you want to try a certain diet or a supplement, <laughs> that's fine. Um, there are some supplements in particular, things like potentially vitamin C, highly concentrated vitamin C or antioxidants that can implicate the effects of chemotherapy. Um, but again, it's all dependent on the amount of chemotherapy that you're getting and the type of chemotherapy that you're having. So definitely chat to your pharmacist um, and your doctor as well to see if there are any supplements that you're taking that could implicate this. Um, and, you know, we really want to work with you to make sure that we can do whatever we can to help support you. So if there are things that you really want to try, that's fine. Flag it with us and we'll do everything that we can to support you. It's always going to be evidence based and it's always going to have your best interests at heart. So definitely, again, be open with your treating team and see what we can do. So how to find some credible information. Um, so... Unfortunately, in Australia in particular, there's no credible governing body for nutritionists. So anybody can really call themselves a nutritionist if they've done a three week course or a three year course at university. So making sure that they've got credentials behind their name and that they've done proper accredited information um, and courses is really important. Every dietitian is a nutritionist, but not every nutritionist is a dietitian. So in order to become a dietitian in Australia, you do have to undergo lots of placements and a lots of accreditation processes. And we are governed by um, Dietitians Australia. So you need to look for the APD status behind the dietitian's name to know that they've gone through the proper training to be able to get there. I am an APD, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, and social media, it's all this wellness is, is everywhere these days. So it is a bit of a trap. We need to be very careful. If there are any bits of information that you found that you're not sure of, flag it again with your dietitian or somebody that you know is definitely credible. Take it all with a grain of salt as well. And always ask your doctor for a referral to a dietitian if you're struggling with your eating and your drinking or if you're finding things are, are really not going the way that you'd planned or if you want some more help. Um, and we've got some resources here. So during treatment, there's lots from Cancer Council um, and Nutrition Australia. Um, the Peter McCallum website, you're more than welcome to visit that. There's lots and lots of resources there too. BCNA, of course, have some, um, some resources there as well. Um, and after treatment and beyond, you know, lots of lifestyle and wellbeing, cancer treatment things there as well with association of those organisations below. So thanks, guys. That's me done. First of all, Erin, I don't think I've ever had anyone spot on their time limit. So well, oh. <laughs> well done, like to the Great. second. But also <laughs> such a wealth of information. There are questions coming through. We want to encourage the questions to continue coming through because we're going to deal with those at, at the end. But um, so many fascinating things I've already learned and so many things I need to ask you about. But <laughs> we will go on to Dr. Eva Zoff. Um, okay. 
who is an exercise physiologist whose research focuses on the role of exercise for the management of cancer. She's currently a postdoctoral research fellow at the Mary MacKillop Institute of Health Research at the Australian Catholic University in Melbourne and head of the uh, Cancer Exercise Lab at the Cabrini Cancer Institute and the Department of Medical Oncology at Cabrini Health. Clearly an underachiever. Eva, I'm handing <laughs> over to you. <laughs> thank you, KP, and thank you, VCNA, for the invitation today to present on movement and exercise li when living with metastatic breast cancer. So I think we probably all know that cancer and cancer treatment may be associated with a number of uh, debil debilitating side effects that really significantly impact the uh, quality of life. And so for the, fa for the past 40 years, actually now, um, researchers in the field of exercise oncology, including myself, have been trying to understand whether and how um, exercise may help in managing some of these or even potentially all of these side effects. And um, while initially there was some hesitancy to pres prescribe exercise to cancer patients, we now have international and national um, health organizations um, really publish exercise guidelines and there's a, a really big call for exercise to be integrated as a standard component of cancer care. So specifically in 2019, the American College of Sports Medicine uh, Roundtable on Exercise Guidelines for Cancer Survivors concluded that there's strong evidence to suggest that exercise can help um, reduce cancer-related fatigue, improve physical um, function, anxiety and depression, and, and quality of life. And there's actually uh, quite a bit of observational uh, data there now to suggest that exercise can also help um, improve survival for some cancer types, and this includes um, breast cancer. So in terms of the um, current guidelines, um, they state that um, people living with cancer should try to avoid um, inactivity and aim towards exercising or doing aerobic exercise 150 minutes per week and doing two um, resistance exercise sessions per week. So what's aerobic exercise? It's an exercise form um, where that predominantly um, um, stresses the cardio or cardiovascular system. Sorry, so we use our large muscle groups that, um, and it's exercise that we can maintain continuously, and that's repetitive in nature. Um, so it's our walking, our cycling, our swimming, and then we have resistance exercise, which predominantly stresses our musculoskeletal system. Um, so those are exercises where we actually have to work against a um, an external uh, resistance, so that's your push-ups and your squats and so forth. Now, we do have to acknowledge, however, that most of the evidence that has led to these uh, guidelines and, and to these recommendations come from um, studies that have included um, patients with early stage cancer and those in the curative setting. So when we actually look at the evidence for people living with metastatic cancer, and, and by all means, this is not a comprehensive search I've done, but there's actually only a handful of randomized controlled trials, which are high quality um, trials. And, and it does appear that the results are somewhat inconclusive. Now, it's not surprising that we don't have as many trials yet, because there was actually initially, um, there are concerns around, around safety, which is why we often excluded patients with um, metastatic cancer in some of these trials. So if we, if we do take together all the, the evidence we have from other advanced cancer um, populations and also trials that are not randomized controlled trials, we do see that um, it does suggest that exercise is safe. And, and feasible and that um, there may be beneficial effects. But we do just re require a bit more research to, to get really robust evidence. And I should say here as well, because um, you might see with some of these trials that there's actually no change and, and just highlighting that in this metastatic setting, often what we just like to do is uh, or aim for is to prevent a decline. So we often see that patients um, do decline quite significantly um, when, they're, when they have advanced disease. And, and our aim here is really just to maintain, uh, you know, your fitness and function so you can keep on going with your um, daily activities and, and engage in what you, you'd like to do. So there is some encouraging survival data emerging as well from observational studies with this one um, showing that um, if you engage in one hour 
of moderate activity per day, you can actually improve um, your survival or decrease your mortality by um, 23%. Um, now, there, is, there are some limitations to this trial, but I just think it's very encouraging and also important because moderate activity, that includes uh, a, a walk at a moderate pace, it includes yoga, it includes gardening. So even your activities that is more, are classified more as incidental activities um, can be really beneficial. So um, there's, again, we, we require more data here, but I think it's an important um, study to, to show and, and is hopefully encouraging to, to really um, get active. Now, finally, and, uh, and w what we also know is that actually um, people diagnosed with uh, metastatic breast cancer, they want to engage in exercise and they, they want to do, have access to physical activity programs. And um, some of our partners that we work with um, over in Europe did some focus groups and um, uh, people that were diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer to say what are the facilitators, barriers and preferences to exercise. And, and, and the main barriers were really the physical limitations, uh, which also include bone metastases and, um, and our insecurity and fear around what exercises they can do, in addition to, you know, do your travel and your time and, and, and obviously COVID-19 in the last few years. And in terms of preferences, um, we, uh, we see that for most, or, or sorry, I should say facilitators first, what facilitates or, um, or our engagement in, in, in exercise is that if there's a, a level of supervision or some professional support that can really help. And if we have those social connections and social support that we often get through exercising, that that's really helpful as well. And in addition to the knowledge around what the benefits of exercise are in terms of physical and um, mental benefits. And, and lastly, also having a fixed appointment. So I see it all the time. We're currently running a study with metastatic breast cancer patients. And they said, if you weren't waiting for me here in the morning, I probably wouldn't get out of bed. <laughs> so uh, that can help us a lot as well. And in terms of preferences, look, it's really one size doesn't fit all. We, we came to that conclusion. I think we know that, especially in this um, population, we have to individualize the exercise programs. But was, what was pretty consistent across the board was that uh, a level of supervision um, was really important. And um, I'll touch on that a bit later um, as well. So just because we know that um, in terms of physical symptoms that most limit physical activity is fatigue and also bone metastases play a huge role in, in regard to you know, insecurities and fears. I just want to touch on those a bit more in the rest of my talk. So fatigue is the most common and um, distressing side effect and actually the greatest barrier to exercise in, in people living with metastatic breast cancer. I think we all know it's a very distressing and persistent um, tiredness or exhaustion that doesn't, isn't proportional to any of our uh, daily activities and it is not relieved by rest or sleep. And what's actually quite different in the metastatic um, setting as opposed to our curative patients, where often once they've finished their treatment, fatigue might go away. And, and with these patients um, where we have ongoing, often ongoing treatment and a, um, and a decrease or deterioration of health, um, we actually see that fatigue does um, stick around, uh, like Erin mentioned earlier as well. So it does have a very significant impact on our quality of life. And, and it can, and Aaron mentioned this as well, I think, lead to um, poor treatment adherence or, or our, um, you know, discontinuation of treatment, which is not ideal. So in general, the advice is to exercise, and um, that comes from a, a really large volume of studies. And this is just a summary of or a meta-analysis of um, almost 120 studies that shows that really exercise is the most beneficial intervention um, against fatigue or for fatigue um, with, you know, no, almost no effect for any pharmaceutical um, interventions. And then obviously eating and drinking well, as Aaron mentioned, is very important. Managing your mental health, um, optimizing your sleep hygiene and, and planning ahead and taking breaks and um, I'll um, touch on that a bit more as well. So in terms of our overall research into exercise and cancer-related fatigue, and again, 
Um, a lot of it currently is coming from patients with more early stage um, cancer, but um, we do see that both aerobic exercise and a combination of aerobic and moderate and sorry aerobic and resistance exercise at a moderate uh, intensity is, is is really effective during and after treatment. Yoga and um, Tai Chi have also had some beneficial effects. So um, that's if, if, if that's something you prefer, um, definitely also an option. Whether more exercise leads to more fatigue is, is a, or less fatigue, sorry, is, a, is still a bit unclear. Um, but what we see now from, from all the studies we have that this setting doesn't really matter. So if you're someone who prefers to exercise at home or on your own uh, or under supervision, we do see similar effects. Now, um, again, while we may need more research in, in the metastatic breast cancer setting, um, what we do encourage is that you start exercising as soon as possible. But it, it's never too late um, to start. Um, and really scheduling your exercise during a time of the day when you're least fatigued. Um, so you might figure out, okay, the mornings are actually better. I feel better in the mornings. And then, you know, you try to do your walk in the morning. and. And if you do have a bad day um, or really, you know, intense fatigue, then just reducing the volume and, and intensity of the exercise and, and taking those breaks and um, really doing smaller bouts. So you might be doing a 10 minute um, walk around the block in the morning and then a 10 minute in the afternoon. And if you can fit that in and, and really any activity uh, is better than none. Um, so do keep that, um, keep that in mind. And it doesn't have to be hitting the gym. It's really you're know, walking your dog or taking the stairs, like smaller um, incidental exercise that or activities that will help as well. Now, going on to um, bone metastases, we know that uh, breast cancer um, most likely um, spreads to the bones in 70% of the cases. Um, and we know that, unfortunately, that uh, increases the risk of skeletal related events, so fractures and and um, spinal cord compressions, and it may also lead to bone pain. Um, what we do also see is once there's a presence of metastases, it unfortunately often leads to a decline in physical function and, and overall fitness or performance because um, you might be concerned to exercise and, and then just reduce your activity levels. And that's can be quite detrimental because then that re increases the risk of falls and decreases quality of life. And actually there might be fewer treatment options if, if you know, you're not as well. So this is why, you know, preserving physical function is, is so such a key element and why we really do encourage um, um, people living with metastatic um, breast cancer or cancer in general to, to become active and, um, and yeah, just despite it being quite intimidating, and, and there's just a quote up here from one of the um, patients we've interviewed around just that, you know, concern of uh, maybe having another fracture. So, so providing some good guidance. And then something we also have to consider in metastatic uh, breast cancer setting um, is that the, there's physiological changes or, you know, often higher levels of inflammation and also catabolic processes which Aaron touched on, that can be weight loss, um, that are really also impact our uh, functional capacity and how we adapt to exercise. So that's quite different and uh, to the curative setting, and, and which is why we need more studies as well. So there's a very recent uh, systematic review that was uh, published that summarized all the studies that have been conducted in cancer patients that have bone metastases. And they were actually able to conclude that um, exercise is safe and feasible. And that's because participating in, in these aerobic and resistance exercise programs that these studies did, they didn't show any severe adverse events. So there was no skeletal related um, or skeletal related um, uh, complications. However, all of these studies did have a component of supervision and, and so a qualified exercise professional who at least guided uh, the patients initially. It doesn't mean that you have to do all your exercises under supervision, but if you can access or you, it is recommended that you access some support initially so you yeah, can, can get a proper instruction and, and know what exercises you can do and then you potentially have check-in opp opportunities as well. Now, they couldn't really quantify the effects of exercise in this um, systematic review, 
But they did see that there was a trend um, that the exercise uh, programs, which included aerobic and resistance exercise, did increase physical function and muscular strength. And now in the meantime, there's a, um, the International Bone and Metastases Exercise Working Group that um, put forward some recommendations around um, what you should look after when you exercise with um, patients with bone metastases. And the first one being to doing a risk assessment to really uh, get an idea of what the chances are that exercise might lead to um, uh, a skeletal related event. And that means really getting some more information on your bone um, metastases or your bone lesions, where they are, how um, big they are, um, also get some information on what treatments you're currently getting, if you have any bone pain, if you have um, any history of falls. Um, so the best way to do that is to um, actually to speak to the medical team. So having a, a close collaboration or a close, um, I should say, communication with the, the cancer team and building that up and, and then also you know, feeding back to them how you are going with your exercises is really important. Now the best exercise um, professionals to um, support you in exercising are um, physical therapists or physiotherapists and clinical exercise physiologists who have had training uh, to work with um, cancer patients. And I'll touch on how you can find those a little bit later. And then this is more for the exercise specialist is that, you, uh, that they should really consider if exercise testing before um, prescribing an exercise program is necessary because there are, depending on, on uh, the goal of, of um, the patient, it might not be required. And there are actually some contraindications um, to exercise testing. So, um, you know, not stressing the, um, if you think of strength testing, not um, putting too much load or stress on the region of the body that um, is, is affected by bone metastases. And then lastly, in regard to exercise participation um, or, or prescription, they do recommend that um, similar to um, patients that don't have bone metastases, they can work towards the, the current guidelines um, that I've mentioned earlier. But we do want to emphasize that um, there's really a proper technique and, um, and you know, controlled movement and that we, we take into account where the bone metastases are and prescribe exercises that, you know, where you can either avoid those regions or if you have a trainer who has some experience, you know, you take an approach where you, where you start with really low or no load and then progress really slowly so we don't put too much um, too much load on, on the, on the um, regions that are affected by bone metastases. So I mentioned throughout that we do need more research and we are currently trying to establish some more conclusive evidence. We're conducting an international trial with uh, quite a few partners in Europe. Um, it's a randomized control trial. It involves 350 um, metastatic breast cancer um, patients. We've completed the enrollment um, we're looking at the effects of a nine-month supervised multimodal exercise um, program um, and the effects on fatigue and quality of life, which are our two, which are our two main outcomes. And then we're looking at a, uh, quite a few other outcomes, which is physical function and fitness, body composition. And we actually also have an exploratory analysis to look at survival. So in terms of the exercise program, it's a step-down approach. So how I said earlier, we don't have to do all our exercises supervised. So these uh, ladies that are in the intervention group for the first six months, they have two supervised sessions per week. And then once they feel more confident with their exercise, they step down to one a supervised session um, per week. And, and they're doing a combination of aerobic and resistance exercise at quite a high, um, or at least a moderate to high intensity. Um, but again, we're individualizing the program based on, you know, their, their current abilities, but also the location of their um, metastases. And similar to what I said before, that we can then either, if they have bone metastases, emit certain exercises or take a start slow and go slow approach um, based on the, the patient characteristics and, and the trainer's experience. So we hope to have these results by mid next year, and hopefully that will provide really some more guidance of um, how we can um, support you all. Now, two more really briefly, how can you find exercise support? So we're really hard, hard, working really hard to um, integrate or 
facilitate the integration of exercise into standard care. There are more and more community and hospital-based programs available, so keep an ear out. Um, and if you don't have access to those, try to get access to see an exercise physiologist through um, the Medicare rebate through a chronic disease management plan. Check with your private health insurance. They might have subsidies to see in an EP or provide gym memberships. And then the Exercise and Sports Science Australia website, they have a find an EP in your area um, um, search machine where you can you know, add cancer as a, a, as a um, special interest area and try to find someone local. And if you can't, and I say thanks to COVID, and I really say thanks to COVID, but we've learned a lot about telehealth and how um, you, know, you might be able to find someone um, somewhere else in Australia who can help you. Now, really quickly, and I think we're running out of time, um, just a few take home messages. Again, exercise is safe. It doesn't all have to be under uh, supervision, but if you know, you're starting an exercise program and you, wanna, you have bone metastases or you wanna uh, exercise at higher intensities, do uh, talk to your doctor and look for an EP. Some are better than none. Fatigue, we know it's the best um, um, intervention for fatigue. And um, really, uh, yeah, trying to, or, or not always, we don't want to make you marathon runners. Being able to maintain your physical function and fitness is really a great achievement. And finally, if you can, and it helps, we saw that earlier with the facilitators, find a friend, a family member, a trainer that helps with motivation and really establishing a routine. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva, so much content. I'm loving the um, questions also coming through, but just um, to pick up on the chronic disease management plan uh, advice you gave to people, I think a few people online are going to need to be acting on that. So uh, just under 70%, 69.7% have never had a discussion about the chronic disease management plan, which I think goes to the very heart of why these sessions are so important that we can get people to start the conversations. There is no better place to start the conversations than with those who have a lived experience. So we're going to hear first from Laura, who is also an underachiever, I note. Um, you are a titled continence and women's health physiotherapist with experience in musculoskeletal skeletal and sports conditions. Um, and Laura was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer in 2020 and has managed her symptoms through a combination of diet, exercise and manual therapy. And we cannot wait to hear from your experience, Laura. So I'm going to hand it to you for a, for a few minutes to take us through your experience. Thank you, KP. Thank you, BCNA. And uh, thank you all for hanging out and uh, listening to me today. Hopefully I can um, add some more information, but a bit of a hard uh, act to follow after these two. Um, so yeah, my name's Laura. I am a wife and a mother of two beautiful children, Amelia, who is seven, and Patrick, who is four. Um, I, two years ago, exactly today, I was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer. It was estrogen positive and progesterone positive and HER2 negative. I also had a secondary lesion in my right hip. Uh, following my diagnosis, my physio brain went into high gear and I started doing all the research into um, exercise and diet. I was very comfortable with the exercise side of things. It's kind of my bread and butter as a, as a physiotherapist. And, um, Really, so I was presently surprised to see that it can help reduce a lot of symptoms associated with the treatments, um, as well as increase survival rates. Diet, on the other hand, was a bit of a challenge. Um, all the online research was mind-boggling. Um, you know, from all the myths to, you know, from the no sugar diets to oh, eat the diet related to your blood group. I just uh, really confused me. Um, I was lucky enough though to stumble upon the BCNA website and I found that was a great place to get really good base knowledge in, in that area. In terms of my treatments, first line of treatment was um, hormone blockers. So I was on and still continue on Zoldex injections once a month to switch my ovaries off. Essentially this put me into a medically induced menopause. Following this, I had four rounds of AC over eight weeks. 
and I had then nine out of 12 cycles of Taxol. I had to stop this early and made a tough decision to stop this because I had peripheral neuropathy. So basically had changes, um, sensation in my hands, which as a physiotherapist, isn't that great? Um, so yeah, stop that treatment. Um, however, from the chemo, I had a lot of side effects. So I had, you know, as we mentioned before, the, the loss of the loss of appetite, um, you know, the, the weight gain, the extreme fatigue, and what most scariest for me at least was, you know, the memory loss. I can have conversations with my husband and completely forget about them. Um, I didn't believe him until my sister said I had the same thing with, <laughs> with her. <laughs> um, I used the My Journey app. Um, my Journey app was great to record all my symptoms and I could actually see how my symptoms changed over a, over a period of time. And as you'll see in a little bit, little bit later on, I'll show how exercise really helped in those areas. Uh, the other side effect I experienced as well was the changes in my bowels. And I know Erin's already touched on this briefly. Um, so I would have anything from sort of diarrhea at the, in the first few days following chemo treatment to sort of pasty stool to then going into a bit of constipation towards the end of, end of that cycle. Um, so I was lucky enough that I had a close friend and a colleague who was a dietitian. And she really helped me understand the benefits of the different types of, of fibre to help me control some of those um, changes in stool consistency. So things, you know, for example, like pasty stool, you know, keeping my skin on my fruit and, and veg, um, or even trying, you know, some, something like Norma Fibre as well was really helpful just trying to help change its consistency of being really sticky and pasty to being a bit more formed, which was great. She also gave me some advice around my eating because I had loss of appetite and it was mostly due to everything tasting like metal to me and I just had no joy for food anymore. So she mentioned just eating, you know, small, more frequent meals to really help me, you know, get through that, through that. And I'm glad to say that after I stopped the chemotherapy, my love for food returned, which was great. <laughs> My exercise, um, I had to restart. So after having kids, I found it really hard getting into a, a regular routine. So for me with chemotherapy, it was almost having to start from scratch again in terms of my exercise routine. Um, my biggest concerns around treatment were being in menopause. So my bone density as well as, you know, the, the hip metastases as well was a real concern for me. Um, but also I knew that exercise could help with a lot of my fatigue and my mental function as well. And for many years, my patients had been, you know, hounding me going, you have to try CrossFit, you have to try CrossFit, it's amazing. And I just kept going, no, 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 it's okay, that, that's not, <laughs> not for me. But, you know, I don't know why, and in the end of the day, I ended up choosing CrossFit and I think it's because my love of weights and it's something that I was familiar with and, you know, from the constant hounding of my patients that I decided to give that a go. I found it an amazing experience. So I had, you know, a, a I went in there for the fitness, but I really stayed for the community, having people around me who were also motivated by fitness, but also knew what I was going through, so were really supportive. I had coaches who um, not necessarily understood, you know, the cancer side of things, but they understood that I needed time to rest. Um, I needed to modify my exercises depending on what phase of my treatment I was in. So whether it was during chemo or, you know, or post post-surgery um, and this really gave me the confidence to be able to continue with exercise because when I first started I could barely do you know 30 seconds or a minute of exercise before my heart rate went through the roof I became quite short of breath. Um, I'm happy to say though that within three months of continuous you know exercise these symptoms improved quite a fair amount and so did my fatigue levels as well and the more interesting part as well and I know part of it will be because of the bone injections that I was having at the same time but by six months my hip met had completely resolved and new bone growth was also showing up on my PET scan and I do believe that part of that was the resistance training as well um, loading my bones and, and improving that side of things. Um, after the chemotherapy I started on immunotherapies and for the hormone treatments um, 
for me, I guess I was lucky enough that I didn't have too many side effects from being in menopause. However, for a lot of my patients, um, when they go through menopause, whether it's medically induced or natural menopause, symptoms of pelvic organ prolapse, you know, such as heaviness, dragging sensation in the vagina, you know, it start to appear. They might have had that prolapse from potentially from childbirth from many years earlier. But during menopause, because our tissue in the vagina changes and our pelvic floor tissue changes, that these symptoms become more more obvious. Also, other than symptoms is stress and incontinence. So that's leaking with coughing, sneezing, jumping, um, even weightlifting, double unders, box jumps and so forth. And we know that exercise can be really beneficial with these symptoms in helping um, resolve some of these symptoms. However, it can be a big barrier to exercise as well. But knowing that there's help out there. So, you know, if you have pelvic organ prolapse and you get a dragging heavy sensation, you're not wanting to exercise because of that. Women's health physios can help by inserting pessaries, which is essentially an orthotic for the vagina where it helps support the pelvic organs from underneath and allowing you to be able to exercise with significant reduction, if not full resolution of your symptoms. And the same thing with stress urinary incontinence as well. We have devices and we have exercises that can help so that we can keep you exercising to the level that you want and the exercises that you love to do. We can help support you do that. Approximately a year after my diagnosis, I went through um, a mastectomy with a reconstruction from using my lower abdominal muscles. So I ended up with quite a large scar from one hip to, to the other. And this put a big dent in my exercise because I wasn't allowed to do anything but walk for the first six weeks and had to have a binder on as well. During this time, I also put on a bit of weight. Um, so back to the dietitian, I went <laughs> and started looking at, okay, how can I manage this? I don't want to put on any more weight. Um, so things like, you know, I mean, I love my food, but timing was running after two kids is always difficult and challenging for me. So things like, you know, and I know Erin's already touched on this, but meal prep. So actually washing all my fruit and veg beforehand, having everything cut up so that if I need to grab a quick snack, I'm not reaching for the packet of biscuits or, the, or that Tim Tam, which I still do every now and again, <laughs> that I could actually grab a handful of strawberries or blueberries and know that they're washed and, and pop them into my mouth quite easily. So, oh, yeah. Um, so second surgery was quicker recovery, which was good. Um, I was by the stage I was back to doing most things back in the gym. However, I ended up with shoulder pain um, as a result and reduced movement. So I had my own musculoskeletal physio that I saw that helped with there. But I also um, enlisted the help of an exercise physiologist as well. By this stage, I was really loving my exercise, um, but my exercise goals had changed now. So I want to be able to do deeper squats, go past parallel. I wanted to be able to get a, a full pull up, do double unders, and I hated running, but it was something that I'm still working on at the moment. Um, so working with an exercise physiologist was really helping me reach those goals, um, as well as being able to improve my movement um, through my shoulder and, and my pain symptoms as well. So up to now, after 18 months of negative PET scans, I recently discovered that the cancer is back and it's spread again. So it's now in my chest, um, as well as my the lining of my lung and under my armpits as well. It's been really hard this time round mentally um, to get through this. And sorry, just a minute there. Yeah, it's, it's 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 a it's a bigger mental hurdle this time round than than a physical because I am coming in you know a, a bit fitter and a bit stronger. Um, however, you know exercise and nutrition have played a really big role in my recovery and my treatment to this date, and I know it's going to continue helping me, you know, at the next hurdle that's coming up. So my advice to, you know, my patients, to my friends, to anyone going through this is find your treat, your team. You know, cancer treatment's a multidisciplinary approach. Um, and we've really seen tonight how exercise physiologists, you know, dietitians can really 
play a big role in that. Um, so yes, please do find your team and ask the questions and find exercise that you'd love to do and find the food that you love. That's all I can say tonight. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Laura, and for sharing um, and being so vulnerable with us and open in sharing your experiences. And I absolutely know that all the people online will be madly chatting um, and sending you uh, lots of, of love and strength. But I think you give us so many very practical um, examples of what, what we can do um, and what, you know, I think what Eva said about getting control back and you have taken control of what you can and it's pretty bloody inspirational, to be honest. So we are now going to hear from Lisa, who was originally diagnosed with early breast cancer in 2000 and then in 2012 was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer in her bones. Um, she's also a legendary BCNA consumer representative and involved in a number of projects and volunteers uh, at Breast Cancer Care WA. She's a big advocate for keeping fit while receiving treatment and enjoys going to the gym many more times than me, three times uh, a week. Um, and Lisa, I'm going to throw to you over in Western Australia and it's so fabulous to have a West Aussie online with us tonight. Thank you, KP. Um, good evening and thank you for the opportunity to share my story of living with breast cancer for the last 22 years. When I was initially diagnosed in November 2000 at the age of 35, I was super fit. I had decided at the ripe old age of 28 that I should get athletics a go after not doing it since school. I was already playing hockey and I had a fair level of fitness. With my athletics training, I ramped it up to five track sessions and two gym sessions a week and I was extremely fit. So when I found a lump and it turned out to be breast cancer, I was shocked. With no family history, and living a very healthy left lifestyle, it just didn't make sense. I had a lumpectomy and a total auxiliary clearance because back in 2000, they hadn't proven yet that cancer couldn't jump nodes. And then I had six months of chemo and six weeks of radiation. I continued to work except for chemo day and the day after and had radiation on my way to work. I felt that my fitness had helped me through. I didn't have a dose decrease or any delay and my white cells kept bouncing back. I did have fatigue and nausea and in retrospect, I wish I hadn't worked so much. The nausea I treated like a hangover with a Powerade and a sausage roll, which I know is not nutritionally sound, but it worked for me at that stage. I stayed on Tamoxifen for five years and besides annual tests with a few scares, I continued life as normal with a much reduced exercise regime and I continued to play hockey. Nothing changed till 211 when I started to get pains in my chest. At first I thought it was exercise and went to a physio. Then I realised it was only when I was stressed that I finally went for more tests in March of 2012 and was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer in my sternum in April that year. I was quoted the average survival period of that time to two to three years. I had more radiation, started on Femara, the Exgeva and the Zolodex. I think we all have a very similar story there. The Zolodex put me straight into chemically induced menopause and I too, memory loss, like terrible and the flushes at night were so debilitating that I had to retire from work because I could not sleep. I also started on Femara and Femara caused every joint in my body to ache. I had started water aerobics because I wanted to do something that was not a big impact on my body but also gave me a exercise. Um, I had been playing hockey but I had to give up in case I got hit in my sternum. It not only provided relief for my body in the water, it gave me a great workout and companionship. It was great for both the body and the mind and it got me out of the house and moving again. After a while, the joint pain had subsided as my body better tolerated Femara and once again, I ventured to the gym. I started with a 10 week program with qualified trainers with an assessment prior to starting, which gave me confidence to go back to land-based exercising. I worked hard, but I decreased my gym weights by more than 75% and I listened to my body. 
I now knew I had cancer not only in my sternum, but also in my right hip and a spot between my spine and my aorta in my lower back. I did visit a cancer exercise physiologist using the chronic disease management plan referral to make sure I was on the right track and I kept my oncologist informed of my exercise. Following the program, I went back to the gym three days a week and kept my fitness up. My driving force was the thought that I needed to keep a certain level of fitness for quality of life and for when progression happened. Progression came in 2020. I had made eight years. It was a new tumour in my sternum and a physically visible tumour in my collarbone. Three months of chemo followed and I started on Herceptin. I did have to skip the last round as my liver couldn't take it. And I did not find the nausea too bad and found relief this time with drinking sparkling water and dry crackers and of course, anti-nauseas. A much better remedy than last time. I continue to have problems with my bowel, which I'm still trying to get under control. But one of the most annoying side effects besides fatigue was restless leg at night. I had tried magnesium tablets without much relief and then found soluble magnesium, which I'm still taking today. As always, check with your treatment team before taking any supplements. I finished chemo in July, 2020. I had come off Famara during chemo. So when I went back onto it in July, the aching joints started all over again. I gave my body a rest and started back at the gym in 2020. At the gym, I do classes as not only it gives me variety, there is a trainer watching out for you to make sure you're doing things correctly. Don't be put off by group classes. The trainer will help you customise your workouts to take into account your physical restrictions. The group atmosphere not only motivates me, but I've been fortunate enough to make some great friends. The friendships that I have made are also a motivator to go to the gym and to meet up with them with the occasional coffee later. Throughout these 22 years, I've tried to maintain a balanced, healthy diet. It is of course harder during chemo as my sense of smell goes into overdrive. I have to admit there's certain smells from 22 years ago that still make my stomach turn. And I haven't had the icy pole they gave me during chemo since 2000. My approach to nutrition is everything in moderation. I watch what I eat from Monday to Friday and have treats on the weekend if I want. I think that everything is about balance. Trying to maintain a good, good balanced diet can be tough, especially with fatigue. A couple of things that work for me, which we've all sort of touched on, is cooking in the morning. As in late afternoon, I don't always feel up to it. My slow cooker is my favourite tool. I use it all the time. And if I'm making a dish that's freezeable, I will make a large batch and freeze a number of meals for the days I don't feel like cooking. Occasionally, I order light and easy and keep them in freezer as a backup as well. I do use a lot of frozen veggies. As they say, they're as good for you as fresh and so much less work. Last year, I had to come off Solidex. Sorry, it's Jiva, as I now have necrosis of the jaw, which is a side effect of long-term use of this drug. However, I did a bone density test just a few months ago and it was normal, which I was ecstatic about and I accredit that to my exercise. Remember you're not alone and there are many resources out there to guide you, such as BCNA's My Journey and the website where you can find a list of available exercise programs in your area or your local cancer council or even try your local council. In the BCNA website, there's also a link to dietitians in your area. BCNA also have an online peer support community available for people affected by breast cancer to connect with others at any time of the night or day. Also, Cancer Council have Cancer Connect program. It's a free and confidential telephone peer group service that connects you with specially trained volunteer person who has had cancer and a similar experience to you. For those in WA, we have Breast Cancer Care WA, who provides people diagnosed with breast cancer and their families with practical, emotional and financial assistance, all free of charge. 
Thank you for listening to my story today. And I hope that I've given you a few tips to help. Please just make sure you discuss any changes with your treating team and get a chronic disease management plan in place. And this will help you with costs. Listen to your body and trust your instincts. And I'll leave you with this quote that really resonated with me. Cancer is a marathon. You can't look at the finish line. You take it moment by moment, sometimes breath by breath, other times step by step. Thank you. Amazing, Lisa. And uh, just like Laura, there is so much coming through the chat of love and support uh, to you, but so much practical information and we have a lot of questions to get through so I'm going to try and do them as uh, fast as we can. I do want to start with um, Eva and Erin, the real challenges for people living in regional Australia um, who don't have you at the end of um, their driveway. What are some advice for those people about accessing support? So maybe Erin to you first. Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, there are a few things that you can do. Um, you can definitely approach your GP um, and, again, do the care plan um, and see what services are available. Again, as what you mentioned as well, telehealth is amazing um, with COVID, which is amazing. Um, services such as Peter Mac as well, you know, we've got satellites in more regional areas as well. I know Aubrey in particular has a very good cancer centre there. Um, and, you know, we're more than happy to link you in and we can do telehealth consultations or phone consultations if that's something that works best for you. Um, but again, making sure that you're using the online resources, um, linking in with people that might be in the same area as you as well can be really helpful and get that community feel. Um, and, you know, local accommodation can be a short term option as well, especially if you're linked in with um, the hospitals, which we often have a lot of patients do that too. Just come and have that short consult, get yeah. all as much information as you can yeah. before you uh, head home to implement it. Yeah. What about you, Eva, for exercise physiologists? We'd all love to have a personal trainer next to us. Yeah. It's not possible. What's and the no, solution? True, but, and, and I'm just adding to the telehealth because what we've really trialled is, is not just sort of having your consultation with an exercise physiologist, but doing the exercises with you. So it's called remote supervision. So we'll actually get you to set up your, your laptop or your computer that we see how you exercise and we can demonstrate the exercises and you can, de you can then do them and we can correct you. So, so it's not just getting um, you know, support in what you can do, but actually really we can't do hands-on, but we can uh, provide a lot of guidance through, through the camera. Uh, and so we're, we're doing that currently in a couple of studies. We're having a big, a large EU study coming up um, uh, again, with 350 patients, we will trial that as well. Um, but I know a lot of exercise physiologists are doing that as well. So, And can you out. access the chronic plan program through telehealth? Because I know there's been a bit of change in telehealth, so it's a genuine question that I'm that, sorry to put you on the spot and if you're not sure. Yeah, no, I'm actually not sure, I yeah. must admit. Um, probably because I work more in the research field than, uh, than in the uh, clinic, but... Um, yeah, I can't say for sure. Yeah, what we can do is make sure that we will, um, as a Perfect. team, get that and make sure that we add that to our email out to people that will link into this so you can watch it again mm. because you always need to, just like Laura talked about with uh, forgetting things, that this will always be available for you to come back to. Um, yes. I do believe they have extended that to include telehealth. So that it was during the COVID lockdown that they brought it in, and I believe they've extended that now past the the lockdowns. Yeah, yeah. Fan fantastic. Um, so, Laura, we'll, we'll stay with you. Um, what there is a question here about what foods did you find best to eat when experiencing diarrhea? Um, yeah, good question. Uh, so that was probably the opposite. So actually, taking the skin, and Erin, you might have to. Correct me. I, I believe taking the skin off the fruit and veg was was one of them, um, and foods that sort of helped sort of bulk up um, your, your stool. Uh, there were like gastro stop um, and other medications like that. Once again, just having a chat to your GP um, or the pharmacist as well to see what works. I was lucky. It was only for a day or so, so I could kind of ride it ride it out. It was sort of that in between that. That runny stool and the and the constipation I found the hardest sort of you know to deal with. 
Um, is there anything else, Erin, you would yeah. recommend? Basically, yeah. the fibre is the best thing. So there are two types of fibre. You've got insoluble, which I like to think of undissolvable. It doesn't break down. It adds bulk to your faeces. Um, and then you've got soluble, which does dissolve. Um, and that helps to kind of lubricate the bowels to help flush everything out. So insoluble are things like your fruits and veggies, the skin of your fruits and veggies, um, grains, whole grains, uh, nuts and seeds. Those are the things that are going to be adding bulk. So if you can try and incorporate those types of foods, if you've got diarrhea, that's going to be helpful. Make sure you're drinking a lot of water as well to keep hydrated. Um, and if you're really struggling with constipation as well, yes, using some of that fibre that I've just mentioned, but also a lot of um, soluble fibre, so things like noodles, rice, pasta to help gel and help flush everything through as well with a lot of water. Can I stay with you, Erin, on a quick answer to should soy foods be avoided or is this just another myth? It's another myth. Um, <laughs> there's actually a lot of products that we encourage patients to use. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard of Sustagen before, and that's a cow's milk based protein powder. Um, and that's got lots of mineral, uh, minerals and vitamins with it. Ensure powder, on the other hand, is the equivalent, but in a soy based option. So people that have lactose intolerance or people that have um, allergies to dairy, that's something that they can take. Um, about 50% of the products that we have, commercial supplements especially, are going to be soy products. So if it's something that you're not sure of, definitely, again, ask your doctor or your pharmacist, but it's not something that you need to typically avoid. Um, and especially for vegetarians, tofu is a fantastic source of protein as well. So definitely include it if you can. Lisa, one for you, top recommendations for the change in taste. And you would have had a few changes in taste over your 20 years of treatment. <laughs> yeah, um, well, the same as um, Laura, I, the, the last time I came out, the taste of everything, it was all metallic, but I found out I'd actually gone toxic. <laughs> so it was terrible. Um, I I find foods that aren't strong in smell um, but can still be tasty. For some reason, I like sushi because you still had that taste. Um, yeah, things that are not too smelling is probably my tip. I love that. And, um, you know, we all know and hear about well-intentioned friends who want to drop around way too much spaghetti bolognese. <laughs> and I know that that peaks and troughs for people living with metastatic disease. But maybe that's some good tips for people in um, getting the friends who want to do something to help making sure it's not too smelly is an excellent tip for them. Because I think often people want to do something to help, but they have no idea what they can do. And so spag bowl seems to be the, the thing to do, Laura. And I'm sure your kids only want to eat your spag bowl. Oh, of course. So talk talk to me about the friends and how you might have managed them around food and nutrition and the drop-offs. Yeah. I think my mum was probably the worst. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love you, mum. Um, no, like, I just, my fridge was constantly full of food and my freezer was always, you know, overflowing. So I really had to sort of put the brakes on, you know, friends and family um, with bringing in food because quite often I just didn't feel like eating it and it actually increased the guilt as well because I didn't want to eat but also didn't want to, um, you know, waste the food and often my kids wouldn't want to eat what someone else has cooked. They, they love grandma's food so that was always easy. Um, so, yeah, I just had to politely say, look, you know, thank you very much. Um, you know, I'm good for food. However, you know, give them something else they can help with. So for me, one of the biggest things, um, you know, around friends, particularly friends I haven't seen in a number of years, was saying, look, you know, let's catch up. That's what will really help me. You know, let's forget about, oh, we should catch up or we need to catch up. Let's actually set a date and time and, and do it. Um, so I found that giving them you know, specific things they can help with and actions they could do um, really help manage that side of things. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And, hey, let's go for a walk around the lake yeah. as the catch-up, which gets people moving. Mm -hmm. Eva, the is 150 minutes of aerobic exercise, which I think just puts everyone into cold sweat. <laughs> but anyway, we'll deal with that. Is it useful if it's done in like is it as useful if it's done in short spurts or does it need to be done over an intensive 150 minutes no 
And I absolutely understand that that's overwhelming. And um, I, I did want to present the guidelines because those are the guidelines. But we absolutely, first of all, we don't know enough in, in the metastatic setting. And second of all, I, you don't have to do it in, in big bouts. I mean, we, we're still trying to understand. And it, and it always also depends on what your, what your aim is, what you, you know, if you want to reduce fatigue or if you want to, you know, increase your cardiovascular fitness, then maybe you have to exercise at, at higher intensities. But um, absolutely break it into smaller bouts. And, um, and, and particularly if you're, if you're feeling fatigued or, or, or tired, um, shorter bouts, you know, if you can do a 10, 15 minute walk, um, try to increase in, include it in your, in your acti daily activities. Like I work at Cabrini, I park 15 minutes away, at, you know, to just walk. It's a free parking, you save the money, you get a coffee instead, and you get your incidental exercise in. Um, so again, it depends a bit what our, what our aim is, uh, what we want to achieve, um, but absolutely break it up. And, and if it's 90 minutes a week, you know, you're doing great. We want to, you know, gradually increase. You're not meant to uh, leave the night tonight and start doing 150 minutes a week. That's not, yeah, our aim. And I think it's about being realistic, right? Yeah. You, if you weren't doing heaps of exercise before you were diagnosed, trying to run a marathon yeah. within, you know, a few months is probably not no. a good approach. So does moderate mean different to different people depending on how you're entering into this moment in your life? Absolutely. I think often um, if, if you just go off how you feel, so if it's, um, we, we know that, you know, if we want to improve your physical function, for example, or fitness, <clears throat> it does have to feel somewhat hard. But if you go by somewhat hard, and if or if you if you if you go for a walk and, and you do have to breathe a bit harder to chat to your friend, <laughs> then you probably know you're getting to an intensity that um, that is somewhat hard and that that is really stressing your 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 heart or your cardiovascular system and, and your muscles um, to an extent where we'll see improvements. And don't can I just also yeah. say don't forget your breaks because often what happens then is that you know we exercise more and more and more and more. But our body needs time to recover. So actually when we exercise, our, our fitness or our performance goes down. And then it's in that day of recovery that we improve in our fitness. So there is an overtraining as well. So we, we, we really want to give our body a break as well. So don't, um, or, or you know, you do one day where you do a bit more maybe um, resistance based exercise and then you do go for a walk the next day and you sort of give yourself um, some breaks. So, Laura, how do you balance that? The, I was pretty impressed with your um, exercise regime, but how do, you, <laughs> how do you balance that with work, mm. kids, exercise and rest and recovery uh, and the social aspects of community and connection? How do you do it all? It's tough. Um, definitely have a well-thought-out calendar, so everything's got its place and time. And, you know, as a mum, as a wife, as, you know, as a community member, I have in the past really struggled putting myself first. Um, so my mindset's been the biggest thing is that I'm going, okay, I really need to put some time aside for myself to do the exercise because I'll look after me. And if I'm not looking after myself, I'm going to be absolutely useless to everybody else. So I know on the days that I work out, I'm actually mentally better and I'm more focused and I can actually be there better for my for my kids and, and friends and family. So I keep looking at those at those positives. Um, and in terms of like the exercises themselves, there are there are days that I just don't have any energy to go to the gym. Um, but you know what, I show up and I'm, it might mean that I only do like a quarter of the exercises that are, are prescribed. And it's taken a lot of effort on my end, again, mentally, just to go, look, you know what, it's all right today. It's okay not to do what as prescribed and do what I, what I can do, knowing that the benefits are there. Yeah. So I guess being kind to yourself and putting yourself, you know, first, I think are probably the two biggest um, messages that I could yeah, say would be most helpful. I'm going to come back. I'm giving you and Lisa a warning about um, – messages that you wish you'd told yourself maybe five, ten years ago that you need to 
for, to help people with that. So I'm just giving you a heads up that I'm doing that while I try and get through some fire fast questions to you. Um, what vitamins are safe to undertake while undergoing chemo? You probably can't go into all the detail, but maybe a connection to a resource of, of where to go for that. Um, I think the best one would probably be your doctor or your pharmacist, to be completely honest with you. Um, but again, Cancer Council definitely does have a good resource on supplements and a good section that you can touch on there um, as well. Um, tofu flax seeds. Uh, there's so much conflicting information about ER positive cancers. I'm a vegan, so tofu is a good source of protein and calcium and also great. However, depending on who you talk to, clinicians are giving different advice on what to avoid. How do you, what advice do you give for that one? <laughs> yeah, again, tricky. Um, there is lots of, um, you know, myths and stuff out there and it's really tricky. So look, it's, every day there's more research that's coming out make sure that any research that you are looking at is going to be you know a randomized control study or something like that um, again talk to your doctor talk to your pharmacist the biggest aim when it comes to your nutrition is to make sure that you've got enough protein to keep your muscles strong your immune function strong and as a vegan it means that you're limited with your protein sources so if you were to eliminate things like say flax seeds or tofu you're really going to be at a disadvantage um, and you're going to leave yourself open for for more weight loss so definitely I would be including those in your diet. Okay, the elephant in the room, oh God. alcohol. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was impressed that you didn't even touch on it once in your presentation, <laughs> but it has come up in, uh, in the questions. So your advice on alcohol? I mean, life's short, isn't it? <laughs> no. um, you got to give it a little bit of a go, but, of course, I can't just go ahead and say drink to you a lot and like whatever you want. But, yeah, again, consult your doctor, consult your pharmacy, very much as what Lisa said, you know, everything in moderation. Um, if it tastes awful for you, then you're probably not going to want it. If it tastes great for you and a glass here or there is something that really improves your quality of life, then that's what we want to aim for. So just as long as you make sure that, you again, you're open with your treating team, you let them know that this is something that you'd like to try or is it okay to try, then go for it. Ava, hydrotherapy mm. as a form of exercise. Yeah, and I, I um, think Lisa commented on it as well, um, how beneficial she found it. If I, you know, put the research um, hat on, <laughs> we the the evidence is a little bit inconclusive. So we have studies that show beneficial effects. We have some that show, um, yeah, no change. Um, we did a trial um, when I was in Cologne, and we saw beneficial effects on pain and quality of life. And I think absolutely, it's a, a natural resistance water, so you can do some strength exercising in it. It's actually a reduced risk of, of falls or any injuries as long as you don't slip on the tiles in the pool. Um, if you have a weak immune system, pools can actually, um, we would recommend to avoid it. Um, if you have the chat, you know, if you have your own pool or the, the ocean, it might be a little bit cold, but um, yeah, if it, if, it, if it helps with your mental health and, and you feel like you're becoming stronger, absolutely, um, I, I would um, recommend trying it. Um, it doesn't really help to load the bone. Like if we, you know, um, if you want to, and this is if you don't have bone metastases, um, improve your bone health, then land-based exercises are probably a little bit better. There is, um, I know we're running over time, but I think this is an important question that has come through. Is there a healthy way to lose weight while you're going through treatment? Um, because obviously we know people gain weight through, through treatment and this um, particular person said they've gained almost 20 kilos since being diagnosed. What's the right way to get back down? Yeah, um, and look, again, it's it's very individualised and it's really difficult. Um, I think especially as women, you know, it's really difficult when we go through those phases of, you know, immense weight gain or weight loss and there's always a particular, you know, body image or shape or size that you have to be and it's really hard with the media as well. So um, I think the first and foremost thing is, you need to make sure that, you know, you're not losing weight because you feel like someone's told you that you have to or because you feel like you have to. If it's because you feel as though it's impacting your quality of life, then something quite slowly and controlled working with someone like a dietitian is going to be recommended. So we typically, uh, in a cancer setting, especially at Peter Mac, you know, um, it's not super, super common for us to be encouraging weight loss for patients. As long as you're having a healthy, balanced diet with lots of protein and energy, that's the first 
and foremost thing. But if you are really wanting to lose weight, you can definitely chat to your community dietitians as well. But aiming for probably no more than half a kilo a week, I would say would be a safe amount. I wouldn't be recommending more than that. But making sure you've got a balanced diet, um, regular exercise, yeah. Um, and just making sure that you're not losing weight because you feel as though you have to. Making sure that it's because, you know, you might want to improve your quality of life. That's that's the most important thing. Yeah, I think the mental health aspects we've all touched on tonight and there's um, so much more information we can provide through there. So just to remember that there are additional resources. Now, Laura, I want to say to you, what you know, what is your final words of advice to people who, who tonight are listening to you living with metastatic disease, living with those hopes and hurdles that you so eloquently outline? What, what advice do you give to them? It's a tough question. Um, <laughs> I guess that, uh, you know, you got to realise that you're beyond your diagnosis, you know, and it's shitty, it sucks being diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer, but you can thrive beyond it. Um, so surround yourself by people who love you and, and support you. Do the things that you love, eat the foods that you love, you know, as well. Um, and yeah, just look after yourself, you know, and, and be kind to yourself is probably the biggest thing that I can suggest. And Lace, what would you tell yourself back now in 2000? Oh gosh. <laughs> um, I think I would have told myself to slow down, take more time to rest. Um, since metastatic, um, same again. Uh, giving up work was really hard for me. That was my identity. Um, so it's about putting that into perspective as well and be kind to yourself because I think as women, you always put everyone else before you. Not that I've got kids, but just generally that's what women are like. I used an analogy once with a lady at a gym who's very much trying to lose weight and I said, it's like on the plane, you put on your mask first before you help anyone else. And I said, that's how you've got to treat it because she felt guilty coming to the gym when there was family issues. So, yeah, be good to yourself and put yourself ahead for now and then. Yeah, it's so true um, that so many women put themselves last and the importance of doing that. Tonight I have heard about being kind, uh, about having balance, um, about the importance of community and connection. So I hope um, that and sure that everyone online uh, has received a lot of information tonight. I do just want to wrap up by saying there is a wide range of helpful articles. We have touched on so many aspects of living with metastatic disease tonight, the, the psychosocial, um, the treatment and all of the different side effects. Uh, so I would encourage people to log on to my journey where we can curate and provide you with the information that is specific to uh, those living with metastatic disease. And I'm thrilled that when you go onto my journey um, and if you're a person who identifies it as LGBTIQ plus or a first persons or or a man with um, metastatic disease, you'll be welcomed to the network by others who are just like you. And I think that's what's really special about my journey. We can deliver that information that's right for you. And also in particular, there were some great questions around rural and remote regions. So we will be able to link you to information um, that helps you to find the services uh, that so many people in metro areas um, can access. So in addition, broad range of um, articles, we've got webcasts of just diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer, what's next? We've got our upfront about breast cancer episodes and there's been some wonderful uh, podcasts around um, living with metastatic breast cancer. Upcoming, we've got a new edition of The Beacon coming up, which will be launching 1st of December on the most recent edition. If you haven't um, had it, please call our helpline where they can register for it because uh, June is the feature on The Last Beacon, who is a woman living with metastatic disease um, and on Tredelvi. So it's a really empowering story about the importance of our network advocating for change. There's a podcast around work and breast cancer and Lisa just 
um, touched on that, the importance of work and, and breast cancer, and that deals with metastatic and early breast cancer. Um, and there's a beautiful podcast um, for, for on one of your walks to hear of two uh, men with breast cancer, Harry and Peter, and Harry is living with metastatic disease. And that's really um, a really powerful story about the importance of our network and connecting together with people. So, so much available for you. I do want to acknowledge and pay tribute uh, to those women and men on our metastatic breast cancer lived experience reference groups, of which Lisa is one. They have absolutely held BCNA to account around making sure that we shine a light and provide appropriate resources for people living with metastatic disease. They keep us honest every day, and that is exactly what our lived experience groups need to do, but they also bring to us the needs of those people living with metastatic disease. So um, a big shout out to all of those um, amazing people who volunteer their time uh, to help us with that lived reference group. If tonight has brought up any challenges for you, please reach out for support with Beyond Blue and Lifeline and their numbers are on the screen there. But we are here for you and I would really encourage you to call our helpline on 1800 500 258 where the team of very skilled staff will help to navigate you into any services and information you might need, uh, including where to go for a local dietitian or an exercise physiologist. Um, so I really encourage you to make sure you prioritise talking about diet and exercise with your clinical team. I think often it is put right down the list, but actually, as we've heard tonight, it can very quickly contribute to increasing your quality of life. It has been an absolute joy to be here. Thank you to our incredible speakers. Tonight has been, I've got a page of questions that I still need to get through. Um, so I have no doubt there will be another one of these uh, webcasts coming very soon. But to all of our speakers tonight, thank you so much. And to everyone online, please be kind, look after yourself and just go for one more walk this week. Thanks from everyone at BCNA.